Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. You know, there are people who, who, who change the world. There are people who grow up in Hartford, Connecticut, become Green Beret, Special Forces, run Merrill Lynch, run UBS, and then they become producers of Broadway shows. Today I'm fortunate to have a person who is a true philanthropist, a true businessman, Joe Grano, who is the chairman and CEO of Centurion Holdings. Hi. So, Joe, you know, you and I are basically contemporaries. I was born in Brooklyn, and you were born in Hartford. Um, the oldest of six, right? Six, six boys. Six boys over yeah. there. And you were telling me that your, your dad, who was born in the belly of your grandmother at Ellis Island, right? On the well, way to Ellis Island? When she went through Ellis Island, she was pregnant with my father. They went off to Cheyenne, Wyoming, to work on a railroad, and he was born in Cheyenne. Then how they came to Hartford, Connecticut. How they end up in Hartford? They didn't know anybody, uh, but there were, there was a large Italian community in Little Italy in Hartford, and they must have had some acquaintances and came back when the railroad didn't work out and started there. Now you mentioned to me that your dad, uh, during the Depression, enlisted in the Army, and he was a master sergeant, uh, spent yeah. nine years in the Army. That's correct. And then he came back to Hartford. Yes, and opened up a grocery store. So now you're born, and it was, as you said to me, I think, and also in the book, you, you lived in a street called the Avenue, right? It was, uh, at the Franklin Avenue was the center of Little Italy. We called it the Avenue. Uh, but the whole area was about four different avenues, but the Avenue was Franklin Avenue. And you had a variety of interesting jobs as growing up. Uh, but I think one of the most interesting was with the tobacco. What were you doing with tobacco at 14 or something like that? In Windsor, Connecticut, they grow shade tobacco underneath the nets. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Parish. It was actually filmed there. And that leaf is what's used for the outside wrapper of a cigar. Even in Cuba, they would import the uh, tobacco from Windsor, Connecticut. And at 14, I don't know why the labor laws would allow it, you could go to work in the summer for 50 cents an hour. And the bus would pick you up at 5. And all my friends quit. But it... Uh, my father just couldn't afford to give me some of the things I wanted, so now you, I went to work. You had a newspaper route, you had a that shoe was shine, seven. right? At seven, I shined shoes. Between seven and 12, I had two paper routes. 14 picked tobacco, 16 worked on construction. So now you graduate, and you had an acumen for math, and you, you decide, Mr. Grano, who was a, a, a great kid in school, everybody always present in your class, you, you go to Central, 
Connecticut. Uh, were you, you in going there for liberal arts to become a, a school teacher, a math teacher at that time? At the right? time, it was considered one of the best teacher's colleges in, the, in America. So what happened? So, you know, as we were saying, hey, we're, we're young, we're vibrant, we're other things. So one night you're drinking with three buddies? Yes. What happens? Well, I'm just between 17 and 18, and we're playing cards, poker. We're getting a bit drunk. About 3 in the morning, I say to my two friends, you know, why don't we just go fight this war in Vietnam? Remember, at that time, 84% of the American populace was for that war. And in my family, service is a tradition. You're going to serve. So I said, why don't we go in, serve our time, and come back to college when we're a bit more serious? And the next morning, three hungover guys went down to the uh, recruiting station. That's what happened. So then where do you end up? So you, you, you enlist in the infantry, right? Only two of us went in. The third gentleman, the doctor said he's been dead for eight years according to his application. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so I enlisted and then showed up at uh, Fort Jackson for basic training, you're right, in the infantry. And then what happens? Well, I get visited by a delegation from the Pentagon while because I'm in you're basic. taking the test, the aptitude well, I had taken, test. We all take an aptitude test. And, you know, I don't know how true it was, but they came down and said I had scored number one. And they would like to waive the college degree requirement to go to Officer Kennedy School. But by saying yes, I would have to extend from two years to three years. Obviously, it was a wonderful opportunity, so I said yes. And then what happens is you uh, then decide uh, Special Forces, which is another two years, right? You, you can't enlist in Special Forces. They pick you. You can say you'd like to be considered. So I was the only uh, officer candidate that was accepted by Special Forces, which you know is the Green Berets. Uh, however, the brigade commander of the OCS brigade, because of my leadership qualities, according to him, who went to the Pentagon, got my orders revoked, and made me an officer that trained officers, which is called a TAC officer, which I was very upset by. But That was the latrine? Yeah, yeah, I put my fist through the latrine door. But at any rate, made the most of it, became a senior TAC officer, and couldn't get special forces out of my head, so I asked again, could I go to SF? And you had to get uh, I had Spanish, extend, I had language. I had to for two more years. Two more years. Plus the language you had to have. Everyone has to be bilingual. So they send you to language school, and I selected Spanish and ended up in the 8th Special Forces Group playing with Castro and the communists right. in Latin you, America. You go to Col uh, Colon, uh, Panama. Colon, Colon, Panama, yes. Uh, Fort Gulick. And sometimes you wore your name tags, and sometimes you didn't because it was an interesting time in Panama and taking care of Cuba and some other... Well, it's when you left Panama that you had to do those things. You could go on a mission and not come back for three or four months. But So you're here two years, and then it's time to reach Vietnam. Yes. So when do you go to Vietnam? Around 71. Um, go to Vietnam. I land in what they call i Corps, the northern section of Vietnam. And I'm there for 10 minutes and told that I was going to get a Ranger Battalion, which was great news. One, because that's a lieutenant colonel's position. Second, uh, those are all wonderful volunteer soldiers. Ten minutes later, though, the phone rings. As we would say, reserve, oh, right. enlisted man, regular well, soldier. Remember, Special Forces are all volunteers. Right. Rangers are pretty much all volunteers. But the phone rings, and there's a problem up in a place called Quezon you may have heard of where a uh, infantry company was in a terrible crossfire and ambush. They had lost 27, 27. men. And this general <clears throat> took out the company commander, relieved them on the ground, which is a dumb thing to do. And they asked me, could I get these kids off the hill? Kids euphemistically, I wasn't much older than them. We, they came off the hill and they asked me to stay with them for a couple of weeks to calm them down. I was with them eight months later, but they turned out, and they were all draftees, by the way, but they turned out to be a phenomenal group of young men. So now what happens? Now you're, you're, in, you're in the Special Forces, you're in the Green Beret, you're in Vietnam, and you're on a patrol. What happens there? Well, I was a company commander, but unlike most, I always went out on patrol because I, I always felt that if a young soldier is going to go out 
you should be willing to go out. So I would take my, a portion of my command post and go on patrol. We were inserted in a, a location where we shouldn't have been inserted. It was bad intel. We had a brand new battalion commander. I told him it was an ambush. So I went up to become the number two person in line, sent the point man out and he hit a booby trap, which was a grenade tied to a 105 artillery round. And I was right in the crater. It blew me up. I had uh, 19 broken bones. I lost four inches of bone. And right, you had uh, something through your skull. Oh, I also. had a chunk of metal. Everyone thought I got killed. <clears throat> right, and you, the, you said your cross was hanging around your, uh, your neck. Well, that, most people don't know that, but I <clears throat> did have a cross on, and I landed sitting down. I couldn't breathe, but a piece of shrapnel broke my collarbone, cut the chain, and the, the cross landed in my right hand, which was the only limb I could really use. Right, was, uh, <clears throat> and I, then you ended up and they wanted to take you off your arm and your leg. Very fortunate for me, my Italian temper took over. I did not go into what's called shock. If I had gone into shock, I'd be a double amputee today. But they brought me to the hospital and they hadn't given me anything for pain because it wasn't a medevac ship. It was a gunship that took us out. And this doctor comes off the beach with patch magis bermudas, a sweatshirt and sand and kind of in an arrogant fashion. I said, well, Captain, you're going to lose your left arm and possibly your left leg. I got mad. I said, well, you're not taking anything. If you send me to Okinawa and they have to amputate, fine, but you, you're not taking anything. And fortunately for me, there were about 10 soldiers that ran to the hospital. I was popular. And I turned to a sergeant and I said, if he takes my arm, shoot him. So they locked and loaded. And when I came out of the operating room, General Joe McDonough was there and said, Joe, could you get your guys to stand down? And so then you go to Okinawa <clears throat> for some treatment, which uh, was uh, not the easiest. And then you, get, then you go to Fort Devens. Correct. And at Fort Devens, they say, you know, you've got to be here a long time. And you said, to hell with them, right? And you well, know, your wife was pregnant yes. at this time. I got wounded around August 15th. I landed finally in the United States around September 2nd. And fortunately, and I guess a lucky person I am, the New York National Guard w was doing their two, two weeks requisite training. I refused a private room and I could have had it. I was this big captain with all these medals, but I went out in the, in the bay with his troops. And the doctor says, you're not going home until January. So this is September 2nd. And I said, whoa, whoa, my wife is nine months pregnant. And he said, well, when you can walk from me to you, I'll let you go home. So I convinced these National Guardsmen to pick me up every night like a zombie. I couldn't use crutches. So I learned to balance on a cane, broke my stitches three times, told the doctor I was having nightmares. And on September 9th, I walked from me to you. Threw me out of the hospital. He just went crazy. <clears throat> so an ambulance picked me up from Wethersfield, Connecticut, where my parents were living. And I went home, 128 pounds and pretty well stitched up. Then you go back, <clears throat> and then the doctor says, there's nothing we really could do because you could do better yourself. I walked into the hospital 30 days later, and he just said, go home. So now you're, you're still in the military, and you want to get a job, and you really, um, they, subsequently, they give you a 60% disability, uh, permanent disability over there, and you get a job in the uh, real estate business. I was still in the Army on I know, convalescent I leave. I wasn't supposed to be working. But I convinced this owner of a real estate agency in Newington, Connecticut <clears> to let me. So I took the test and became a realtor. But I was still in the Army on convalescent leave. And I did that for about six months. He offered me half of his business, which was really nice. But I opened up the paper, and I see a training program to be a stockbroker with Merrill Lynch. <clears throat> And given the fact that I only had three months of college and everything else I knew was really military, I said, this is for me. And Merrill Lynch originally turned me down, but the local office said, we don't care what they say, you're hired. And I ended up in New Haven, Connecticut as a producer. And during the period of time, you know, you, you didn't have family. You know, you, your father was in construction. He was a former army person. <clears throat> you didn't grow up. But you, <clears throat> you were looking at building business by wealthy people. You wanted to deal with wealthy people. And in a short period of time, you became the number one producer in the office and the number one producer, uh, number one producer in the state and the third number producer in the nation. For well, 12th in the nation. But 
It was a Willie Sutton strategy. <laughs> Why did he rob banks? Because that's where the money was. So if you're going to be a stockbroker, you want wealthy clients. And I created a model that would differentiate me and be of value to those clients. So now they say, hey, Grano, we want you to come to the Big Apple. We want you to go down to Liberty Street. So what happens? They offer you what, the, a job? Well, they, they brought 18 of the <clears throat> biggest brokers in the country to go into a think tank to try to create new products. I was the only dissenter on the product that 17 others wanted to do. I said, it won't work. Turned out I was right. Merrill Lynch lost a lot of money. And then they called me and said, look, you seem to have a pulse on the clients and the brokers. Would you come in and run marketing? Which I had not even two seconds of training. And it was a very interesting time because we were getting deregulated. Right, it was deregulation in the sure. CMA account. We created market. CMA, deregulation, and I ended up running market planning, advertising, sales promotion, and market evaluation. And then, and then you had the situation with regard to the, um, they wanted to make you an AVP and you didn't want to be an AVP. Uh, that's true. What happened was the AVP list came out and there were about 100 people on it. And several of the, oh, maybe half the list, <clears throat> I didn't have a very high regard for them. And I, frankly, would have fired most of them. So I said, no, thank you. I would rather wait till I can become a VP. And Merrill Lynch, the executives from Don Regan on down, got very upset with me and said, uh, sorry, you have to be an AVP first. And I said, well, I guess I'll never be a VP. Right, and then they made you the VP. Two weeks later. Yeah. So, so now what happened is you, you told me you were in a variety of things, but one of the interesting things was with Hunt. What happened with the Hunt brothers? Well, during the silver crisis, I was at that time running operations, including international and margin and commodities. And the Hunt brothers had cornered the market and artificially drove silver to up close to $50. The Hunts got in trouble. The same leverage that caused it to rise was the same leverage that brought it down. And they couldn't get out because silver was going down the limit and you couldn't sell it. There was a meeting held in the Essex House, which I was invited to with Don Regan. And I will never forget this. It was probably the best lesson I ever got from an executive. He walked into the room and he said, we are here to solve a problem. There will be no postmortems. This is not about who did it. This is about what we're going to do to fix it. And that resonated with me for the rest of my career. Then the hunt comes in, Nelson Bunker Hunt, and he has the audacity to ask us for more money. He owed us at the time about, I think about $5 million, which today would be like 50. But he also owed money to all the other firms on Wall Street. And I had sent people to London to make sure we had the silver bullion. And I basically, we had an impasse. And I said to him, Mr. Hunt, if you do not meet a maintenance call by tomorrow morning, I am selling you out, even though I knew I couldn't sell him out. But I also knew that his sisters had accounts with us with non-silver related investment. I said, however, if your sisters cross collateralize the account, I won't sell you out. So he got very angry. He stood up. And he said, young man, red face, do you know who you're talking to? I said, yes, sir. And if you would, please leave that Rolex watch on the table before you leave. So, so Don keep, Regan keep, loved me keep after my that. Collateral, that right. Don Regan loved And we got the cross collateral. We didn't <laughs> right, lose a dime. But, and during the, the period of time, I mean, you progressed. Your, your last job with Merrill Lynch was what? Head of the retail branches, retail sales and marketing. Right. now, 28,000 people. And what happens over here, because you, you could have been a lifer, as they would say, with Merrill Lynch, but there was a circumstance, because I'm trying to get everything in the time period, there was a circumstance that you invested with some friends in a ski lodge and some other businesses. And unfortunately, as one would say, you were left with a bag because you were the one who took the guarantee and made the commitment with the other partners. We were all joint in several. And what happened was <clears throat> we built this big resort. We raised $84 million. And a bank in London came to us and said, we'd like you to consolidate your business with us, which we did. And we were moving to a closing. And at that point, we, we had no guarantees. But one of the banks in the consortium backed out of America. And they said to us, would you go up temporarily? We'll take you out as soon as we can. Well, two weeks after the closing, they themselves, the lead bank, backed out of America. So no one's going to take the principals out. 
I had promised my boss, who was one of the partners, that he would never have to reach in his pocket. And he had the deepest pocket, and the banks would have gone right to him. Correct. Joint and several. Two of the other, we were all joint and several. Two of the other partners did not stand up. They declared bankruptcy. One made himself judgment-proof. So it was myself and my boss left. And I gave him my word. So Payne Weber came along. They had done a survey. Right. They were looking. For, Spencer Stewart was right. looking for somebody. Right. And they had done a survey, and they said, uh, I came in hey, kid, one. you're the one. You're right. number one. We want so you. So they offered me a very large upfront bonus. So I went to the bank. I said, I'll tell you what. I will give you that bonus. I will pay you every dime. No interest. But you don't go after my boss. And he hit the deal. And that's why I left and never told my boss. Right. So you go to after you retire. So you go to Payne Weber at this time who had a large retail staff losing, losing money. ninety million dollars and really was one of the worst places on the street. I didn't even consider him a, a competitor. And you go there as president. As president over there. And the first year from ninety million, I think you turned that around to ninety three million because no. you made three million dollars. We made thirteen. You made thirteen million, so it was hundred and three million dollars over there. And during the period of time, you know, then there was UBS. Uh, you, you took care of the UBS purchase uh, when... I became president of the total company in 94 because the capital market side had lost $250 million. And then we sold the company to UBS, merged it, sold it. Uh, in the year 2000, we were earning $1.2 billion pre-tax. And we sold it for $11.5 billion. The stock, when I first went there, was two dollars and twenty six cents. We sold it at seventy three fifty. Not too bad. Not too shabby. Well, you know, the thing I'm most proud of is that we did something that I don't think any other firm had done. I always felt that the support people were at cross purposes with the producers. So if a broker wrote a hundred tickets, the wire operators get all goosey and warm. It's more work. So I created the system that you could take up to ten percent of your pay. So if you were making fifty thousand. I would let you buy $5,000 worth of Payne Weber stock or 100 shares. And I would give you two options for every share you bought, which was equivalent to a 50% discount. So when we sold the company, 40% of the company was owned by employees. Sure and the was. clerks and the secretaries would say, you know, Joe, thanks to you, we can, I can send my kids to college. It, it was the pinnacle of anything I've done. I, I, was, I was so proud of that. While you're at Payne Weber, 9-11 happens. Yes. And tell us what happens over there. Well, I was in a hotel in Midtown. And fortunately for us, our headquarters was in Midtown. 1285. And over in Weehawken. And the first response was to find out if we had any people in the area, and we did. We lost five employees. Um, and, of course, a lot of our competitors, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, scattered. And we learned very quickly that there's a big distinction between disaster recovery and business continuity. Every fire drill you've ever had in your life, you always got back in the building. Well, there were no buildings to get back into. So people scattered, didn't know what to do. So I immediately, once we stabilized ourselves, gave redundant trading floors to Lehman Brothers, uh, domiciled all the Cantor Fitzgerald people, did whatever we could. And then, of course, the gods, so to speak, of Wall Street got together. And it was a very big meeting two days after 9-11 where the government sent the Treasury down. And they wanted us to open up the New York Stock Exchange on Thursday. And everybody was big patriotic. I mean, believe me, the gods don't get along that well. <laughs> they, yeah. they're, they're very competitive. But in this case, Coalesce came together, rah-rah. And fortunately for me, because of my reputation and in the war, et cetera, no one's going to argue with my patriotism. I hit the table and I said, gentlemen, we're not opening up on Thursday. You do that, then the terrorists win. Because you'll go up prematurely and we'll crash and you'll destroy confidence in the whole world. With two minutes left, I got to get a couple of things. You, sure. leave two, you leave UBS in 2004, you start Centurion Holdings. Yes. Now, but the interesting thing is, in, it's about 1984. You're running a program for the retail brokers, a, a trip for the retail brokers, and you bring in a, this group called Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Yes. And what happens is Frankie Valley calls you after that event for your advice about a record studio, right? He actually shows up unannounced, and he had Bob Gaudio, his partner, and five business associates. 
I look at the deal and I tell them don't do it. They don't listen. A year later, I hire them again. They come out on stage and, and Fally goes, all my life people have told me what to do. Only one person has told me what not to do and I'll never not listen to them again. So I've been advising them for 30 years since. Then, uh, 19, it's 2004, 2000, 2006 when the, they're in La Jolla. They're, they're doing the show, the Jersey Boys, and over there in La Jolla, California, where the Beach Boys were Correct. over there, you go down there and they, they say they really need somebody to come in with half the money. That's and you correct. become the major producer of the, the four seasons. One of them, the, yes. Jersey Because I helped them raise the money. Right. Let's talk about it. You're married to Kathy. Yes. And you have three children. You have yes. two daughters. And a son. Daughter's name? My oldest is Angela. My youngest is Andrea. Angela is a singer uh, songwriter. Andrea's an actress. My son's 26. He graduated from Yale. He's a writer. So I have three bohemians. I can't retire. I'll be working right. forever. And, you know, uh, for a kid who didn't finish college, you have six honorary doctorates. That's correct. And, uh, you know, uh, you have a successful book that you wrote two years ago. See, I wrote that originally as a diary to my son. And he kept on encouraging me to, to write it for young people, so I did. I, I, I'm glad I did now. I didn't want to, but I'm glad I did. For the kid from Hartford, Connecticut, uh, you've seen a lot in your life, and you've helped a lot of people, and I'm really happy that you've been a builder of New York and truly a New York life story. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Mike. I appreciate it. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American.